So with cranial nerve two, we're not simply dealing with a sensory nerve, but there's also a motor component, which is how the um, optic nerve controls the pupil to contract the ciliary muscles. Before we can actually go on to test the um, eye, we actually need to make sure the patient's got good vision, which we're going to do with a Snellen chart. So we'll get the patient, if they're wearing glasses, or contact lenses for that matter, to do the examination with the Snellen chart, reading which is the lowest line they can read. So on the side of the chart, it will frequently say, for example, 20 over 20. That's considered to be normal vision i.e. you can read at 20 meters what a normal person can read at 20 meters. Surprisingly, the UK limit for driving is 12 over 20. Something to think about there. If the patient doesn't have their glasses with them, then we can use a pinhole because that will remove any refractive error from their vision. Something perhaps you might want to try yourself. Get a piece of paper and put a dot in it, a small hole, maybe with the end of a pen or pencil, and if you've got any problems with your vision, take your glasses off and look through that dot, look through that hole. And then if we put that hole up to the camera, we should be able to focus through it. But rather than just looking at the table, let's try something more interesting. And then if we take the piece of paper and look through that hole, we can see that Bob's eyes become much, much closer into focus. So without, and with, without, with. And hopefully you should see that your vision, whilst narrowed by the very small dot, is actually clearer now, or as clear as when you normally have your glasses on. So now we need to actually see how well you, uh, your vision is. So do you wear glasses normally? Yes. Okay, do you have them with you? I'm wearing lenses. Okay, and have you had any changes to your prescription recently? No. Okay, so if you look at my face, have I got any black splodges? Am I missing anything? Perfect. So what I'd like to do to start off with, behind me is a Snellen chart. Um, so could you cover your right eye for me? Okay, and what's the lowest line you can read on there? The bottom line. Can you start from the left, please? A, M, O, T. Perfect. And swap eyes, if you could put your hand over your right eye. What's the lowest line you could read? At the bottom. Okay, and start from the right side of the paper. X-V-U-W-T-O-M-A. -E. Perfect. So we've got no problems there. Now, some of the cranial nerves do blend over. So a good example is cranial nerve 2. So when we shine the light in the patient's eyes, we're looking to make sure the pupil constricts. However, that message is being carried up by cranial nerve 2, but the constriction message and action is actually done by cranial nerve 3, the ocular motor. So I'm just going to put it over here. And when we're checking between one eye and the other, we need to make sure that there aren't any unusual responses. So we should expect both eyes to contract when the light is shone in them. When checking the pupillar response, it's worthwhile to make sure you're moving the torch under the nose as opposed to across the eyes. That way you're reducing light bleed. Some people will like to put a hand over the nose so it reduces that light bleed from one eye to the other even more. When we assess the eyes like this, we want to check that the pupils are perlar. Pupils equal and reactive to light and accommodation. So we've checked the light going across each pupil, but we also need to get the patient to focus on something close to them and then also focus on the wall further away. When the patient's eyes come back to look at the close object, we should again see accommodation, so constriction of the pupil. And the next thing, if you could look at my finger, and then at the ceiling behind me, and then back to the finger. Superb. In terms of a relative afferent pupillary defect, there are several things that could cause this. Have a think amongst yourselves, and if you've got any ideas as what those could be. So potential causes of a relative afferent pupillary defect would be multiple sclerosis, hope you're seeing a theme here, diabetes, problems with the retina itself, retinal detachment, and retinal infarcts, all of which stopping the signal going up the cranial nerve too. We also need to be aware of another condition called a 
Argyle Robertson pupil. This is due to tertiary syphilis, when the syphilis has reached the brain and damaged the optic nerve. Here, the pupil is said to accommodate but not react, i.e., if you shine the torch between the eyes, the pupil will remain constant, but when you get them to look at something close and then far away, you'll see the expected changes. There's one further abnormality that we need to be aware of with regard to the pupils, and that's if we have Horner's syndrome. That's a triad of three things, ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. So the patient will find that they have difficulty um, raising up the eyelid. The upper eyelid will be drooping down. They'll have meiosis, so a very small pupil that doesn't dilate when we take the light away. And anhydrosis, the failure of sweating on the affected side of the face. That is due to something pressing on the neck, potentially a pancos tumor arising from the lung, causing pressure on the sympathetic chain, impairing that function. So once we've confirmed that the eye is working with the Snellen chart, we can see how it's working and that's worthwhile to give an Ishihara chart, as we've explained in some of the previous videos, where we can see what the nature of the patient's colour vision is. And that can be quite important for one particular condition, particularly multiple sclerosis. If there's a problem with the optic nerve, then a patient will get what's called red desaturation, that the red on the side that's affected won't look, for want of a better phrase, as red as it would do otherwise. Often you'll see neurologists using a hat pin because nobody else needs hat pins these days. So what we'd get the patient to do is we'd show them the hat pin and we'd get them to put a hand over one eye and see how red the top of the hat pin looks. We'd then get them to swap over eyes and see whether or not there was any red desaturation by comparison, i.e. did the top of the hat pin look the same on both sides. However, as I say, you can just use a red topped pen. In terms of confirming the size of the blind spot, we need to move the red dot, or the hat pin, around inside our blind spot, confirming when we can see it, and making sure that the patient can see it in those same areas. This is very important. It's because of diabetes causing damage to the retina, specifically cotton wool spots. If we've got demyelinating diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, or if we have problems with hypertension, which would also damage the retina. Something called your blind spot. So if you could put a hand over one eye for me, okay? And I want you to only look into this eye here, and at some point, as I move the pen across, the pen will disappear, or the pen top will, okay? So if it's gone now, I'm gonna carry on moving it across, until when it reappears. Back. Okay. I'm going to go backwards. So Gone. is it okay? Now tell when it reappears. Back. Okay. So Gone. Um, okay, I'm going to go up now. Back. Okay. And then down. Gone. Super. Okay. And last one going to back. Back. Excellent. So we swap over to the other eye for me. Again looking into my eye here. So tell me when it disappears. Gone. Okay. Tell me when it reappears. Back. And just tell me when it disappears. Gone. Back. Okay, fine. I'm now going up. Back. Okay. And tell me when it disappears. Back. Excellent. So your blind spot lines up well with mine there. Uh, but thank you, I appreciate that. That's a slightly difficult test to do. We'd want to get hold of an ophthalmoscope and we want to have a look at the back of the patient's eye, checking on the retina. If we're going to be assessing the optic nerve, we need to make sure that we understand that the retina is actually the most external facing part of that optic nerve. And on the retina, we'll be able to assess for papilledema and the evidence of raised intracranial pressure. We then need to assess the patient's fields of vision. With that, we're going to get the patient to sit a metre away from us, and we're going to have them close their right eye to look into our left. Get the patient to fix their vision to yours, and not move their head or their eye. From there, move your arm in an arc 
on the lateral aspect of their vision to see whether or not they can see your finger waggling at the edges of gaze. Do the same again with your opposite hand to check the medial side of their vision. There are many things which can affect the visual quadrants, how much of the retina is functioning. Two of those being raised intracranial pressure, as mentioned, but also pituitary tumours, which can give characteristic appearances in terms of mapping out the patient's visual field. In terms of loss of the visual fields, there are three key um, findings that we want to look out for. The first being bitemporal hemianopia, where the patient can see directly in front of them, but has lost the vision to the edges of their periphery. This can be seen in meningitis and, as mentioned, in a optic chiasm compression from a pituitary tumour. And that's sitting directly over the optic nerve here. If this little bulb grows in size, then it's going to put pressure on that crossover of the optic nerve is and is going to cause us difficulty with vision, specifically that bitemporal hemianopia. Almost Opposite to bitemporal hemianopia, we can have binasal hemianopia, where we are losing the inside part of the vision. That tends to be a vascular problem in the optic radiations at the back on the inside of the brain, whether or not this is a stroke or other vascular problem. That blockage there, as I say, will feed back down the optic nerve in order to um, lose the middle part of the vision. You can also have homonymous hemianopia, where you are losing sight on one side of the retina. However, the lesion is opposite to where the problem lies. So, for example, if a patient has a lesion in the left hemisphere, then it will cause right-sided homonymous hemianopia. So, to put that one back together, when we're testing the visual fields, we are using our fingers um, as moving markers and we want to make sure that the patient can see our finger coming in from the side at the same point that we're seeing our finger coming in from the side. If there's a difference there then when we can see the finger but the patient can't then that's indicating that they don't have functioning sight in that part of the retina and that will then tell us which part of the brain is being affected and potentially lead us to our diagnosis. So now we're going to see how well your eyes work on the very side. So we're going to look at your peripheral vision. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure I'm the right distance away. Okay, so you can see my finger waggling? Yep. Okay, tell me when you can see my finger waggling. Yep. 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 That's fine. I'm just going to come across the other side. Yep. 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 So if you could just swap eyes for me. Okay. And you can see my finger waggling? Yep. Okay. Please stay looking in this eye and tell me when you see my finger. Yep. 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 Okay, super. 